uh, along with these um, instructors, we have two scholars, two PhD scholars, Mr. Brahmaya and Kapil, are working as a TAs for this course. Uh, they are working in the area of uh, high performance computing. All right. When we look at the contents of this course, uh, when we look at the title of this course, this is uh, concurrent programming. Uh, don't wait for free lunch. Okay, I'm going to explain what is free lunch, why we should not wait for free lunch. Right, when we look at the course schedule, actually today I would like to cover introduction to concurrent programming and concurrent objects and linearizability concepts. Okay, most probably tomorrow, uh, Dr. Kalyan will explain about uh, memory consistency models and a few cache coherence protocols. And 27th, uh, Dr. Saurabh is going to discuss about the mutex logs and spin logs. Again, on 28th, I would like to cover uh, course uh, different synchronization techniques. Mainly, I would like to focus on uh, uh, lazy synchronization and optimistic synchronization and fine grain synchronization. Again, on 29th, uh, Dr. Devi Prasanna Sahu from IIT Roorkee, he would like to discuss uh, coherence protocol verification. Okay, anyhow, you people have some idea about Messi protocols and Moisey protocols, just like uh, Messi and Moisey, few other protocols are there. You would like to discuss those things. Okay, at the end, most probably on 20th, uh, on 30th, um, we are going to discuss about uh, concurrent, few concurrent data structures, stacks and queues. Anyhow, you have some idea about uh, stacks and queues. So we, uh, we will focus on um, skip lists and a hash, few hash data structures. Uh, yes, here may, our more main focus will be on how to develop uh, such type of concurrent data structures. Okay. Uh, coming to that, uh, yes, uh, each day we are going to give one or two problem statements. If, you're, uh, if you would like to solve those problems, um, you are most welcome. Do you have any doubts uh, while solving those problems? You can communicate uh, any one of the faculty members or TAs. Here I provided the uh, mail IDs of TAs, uh, Dr. Mr. Brahmaya and uh, Kapil. Both, both are doing PhD at Mahendra University. Right. And next one. Yes. The name itself, when you look at the name, this is a um, HPC course on concurrent programming. You know that the definition of concurrent, many, many, of you, many of you know the definition of concurrent programming. When we look at the definition of concurrent programming, it is overlap, low execution of tasks. Right. What is meant by that? Uh, when you look at the uh, picture, uh, you can find a, uh, that that is a kind of a data structure. What kind of data structure that is? May I know that data structure? It has two keys, right? One is a character and second one is a number, right? When you look at the uh, character, actually uh, English alphabet, it satisfies the uh, BST property. When you look at the numbers, it satisfies the um, HIPAA property. Okay, that data structure satisfies the BST property and HIP order property. Uh, so we are going to call it as a tree. Okay, here we don't bother about uh, definition of uh, tree and all those things. Yes, there is a data structure in a shared memory environment. Okay, multiple threads are performing some operations on data structure, right? So suppose let us assume that, okay. Uh, we have three threads, one thread is performing uh, in, uh, one thread is performing insertion operation, another thread is performing deletion operation, another thread is performing a search operation. In that context, uh, suppose if a shared memory environment supports all kinds of operations and a particular data structure, okay, that type of data structure is called a shared data, so concurrent data structure. Why do we need uh, such kind of uh, concurrent data structures? Uh, that is an interesting question, right? When we look at the uh, recent uh, 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 when we look at the recent process, we observe that uh, in the market we can see the different types of uh, desktop process. That is uh, Intel i7 with the four cores and eight threads, eight cores and sixteen threads, twelve cores and twenty four threads, 
64 cores and 128 threads. Okay. Uh, from AMD, you can see 64 cores and 128 threads. From Intel, uh, you can see four cores and I think most of your laptops, uh, it's a, it, has, it is a multi-core machine, right? Are we able to use all the available cores in our laptop? Okay, suppose if you write a simple program, can we make use of the all the available cores of our laptop or desktop? Yes, yes, at least some of the people can make use of all the available cores, okay? Yes, most of them may not have an idea about how to use the all the available cores so to achieve a part, uh, to, um, for a particular task. Okay. Yes, in this course, we uh, we are going to concentrate on how to achieve that particular task for better throughput. Okay, not only throughput. Okay. We can reduce the uh, power consumption also. Okay, how the power consumption can be reduced, we are going to discuss uh, in this particular uh, mini course. Okay, here uh, we are trying to deliver all these lectures by considering suitable number of examples. Okay, yes, actually we are not going to cover whole theory. Okay, first we are going to show the demonstration. Later we are going to discuss theory behind that. Okay. Yes. Do you have any doubts? Yes, that is a tree. Okay, fine. Yes, when we look at all these process, all these process, either Intel or AMD, bo both the process supports the con uh, concept of hyperthreading. Yes, what is hyperthreading? When you look at the uh, this particular diagram, you, you can see that ALU is shared across two cores. Okay, why ALU is shared across two cores? Okay, ALU design of ALU is a very costly affair, right? Okay, so that is why ALU is shared across uh, uh, multiple number of uh, many number uh, okay two or more cores. When ALU is shared, yes. Um, when we look at the uh, function, um, when we look at the hardware of ALU, ALU has multiple functional units uh, such as integer units, floating point units, FMEs, branch prediction units. Okay, many hardware circuits um, will be provided in ALU. Okay, at the same point of time. Uh, one cannot use, that means a particular pro process uh, cannot use all the available hardware. Only 20 to 30 percent of the hardware used by the particular thread. Yes, during that time, remaining part of the hardware is free, right? That is why uh, scientists came up with uh, how, why should we waste the resources of uh, ALU? So, for uh, efficient utilization of ALU, the ALU can be shared across multiple number of threads. A multiple number of hardware threads. If ALU is shared across multiple number of threads, we can achieve the better performance. That is the concept of uh, hyper threading. Okay. Do you have any any doubt until this point? No. Okay. Right. I would like to explain the concept of uh, multi uh, concurrent programming by considering a very simple example. Um, you have some idea about uh, matrix multiplication, right? How do we multiply two matrices? To multiply any two matrices, okay, a number of columns of the first matrix should be equal to the number of rows of the second matrix. Then only we can multiply two matrices, okay. Yeah, that is a simple concept. How these two matrices can be multiplied? These two matrices can be multiplied by writing a very simple program with the help of uh, three for loops. Uh, we can easily build that particular logic in any one of the programming languages. Yes. Yes, when we look at this particular uh, uh, problem statement, okay, suppose if we consider uh, uh, two matrices, okay, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to consider two matrices of order n by n. To multiply two matrices of order n by n, how many number of multiplications we need to perform? We need to perform n cube number of multiplications n cube number of multiplication. Why n cube number of multiplications? 
resultant matrix of order n by n okay resultant matrix of order n by n uh, for each element okay we need to perform n multiplications for each element we need to perform n multiplications yes in this context uh, when we uh, th uh, think about this particular problem statement uh, this pro this problem is highly parallelized right okay uh, yes suppose if you write a, some simple matrix multiplication why should we write a single thread code we can write a multi thread code and we can get a better performance right yes by making use of uh, our simple laptop that is four core and eight threads uh, with the help of our laptop itself we can get the better performance that is why i consider this particular example let us see how do we get that particular uh, thing with the help of that with the help of simple program yes uh, usually to multiply we can multiply the matrices in any order okay we can consider this particular block of matrix and we can multiply that particular block of matrix with uh, b that means we can consider this particular block of matrix and we can multiply with this particular block of matrix and we can get uh, this particular one similarly we, if we multiply this particular block of matrix with this particular block of matrix we can get this particular one just like that we can compute the whole result okay how it can be computed yes it can be computed by using uh, one thread or it can be computed by using multiple threads how it can be computed by using multiple threads okay for the sake of simplicity i considered uh, four threads thread zero thread one thread two thread three thread zero is responsible uh, to multiply this uh, the, all the elements of the uh, second matrix we are going to consider all the elements of this uh, the, this row we are going to multiply with uh, these columns elements in these columns then we'll get the uh, first row in the resultant matrix similarly when we take the next row uh, from the first matrix and we are going if we multiply that that row with all the elements of the second uh, all the columns of the second matrix then we will get this next second row in the uh, resultant matrix just like that we can do the multi thread matrix multiplication when we look at the logic of this particular multi thread matrix matrix multiplication this is very simple and straight forward okay just like the normal matrix multiplication okay here also we are going to write uh, three for loops okay uh, first for loop is for to identify the thread number usually here in in this particular 4 by 4 example thread 0 is responsible uh, for first row in the resultant matrix thread 1 is responsible for the next second row ne next row in the resultant matrix just like that okay each thread uh, takes that particular uh, responsibility okay how it uh, how that can be achieved that can be achieved with the help of uh, these for loops okay are you able to understand this uh, this logic do you have any doubt if you are able to understand this uh, this particular logic i would like to show the demonstration right do you have any doubt with this no right yes when you look at the source code of this particular program this course source code is very, is very simple and straightforward nothing is there here we have a constructor in that constructor we initialized these three arrays a b a b and c after that um, we are going to initialize the number of threads okay uh, here what we did when you look at this particular main program okay uh, we are reading the arguments from the command line uh, we are going to read uh, six arguments okay first argument is the number of threads second argument and third argument is the uh, rows and columns of the first matrix fourth and fifth uh, fourth and fifth are the uh, rows and columns of the uh, second matrix 
the last one is the choice choice is uh, meant for are we going to multiply and those two matrices by using single thread or are we going to use the multi thread matrix multiplication if one is for single thread matrix multiplication or normal matrix multiplication uh, two is for the multi thread matrix multiplication that is the source code okay right other than that remaining part of the code is very simple this is class matrix this matrix uh, purpose of this particular class matrix is we are going to um, I read the particular matrix that means here for the sake of simplicity i initialize all the elements with one if you want you can initialize uh, all the elements with some random number right here we uh, we have two functions uh, one is uh, multiply with particular thread id and second one is simple multiply okay for normal matrix multiplication we are going to call that this particular uh, multiply method uh, for uh, multi thread matrix multiplications, we are going to pass that particular thread ID as an argument to this uh, uh, multiply in TID function, right? Okay. That is the uh, source code. Okay. If you, if you want to, if you need a more explanation, I will pro I'm, I'm here to explain that source code, right? Yeah, I already compiled that one. Here I'm going to use uh, one number of threads is one. Uh, matrices of order thousand cross thousand. Uh, last argument is choice. If choice is one, we are multiplying by using. Uh, okay. What is the problem, Java C? Fine. Operation. Okay. Sorry. Sir, file name is capital O P. Yeah, maybe I did a mistake there. No problem here. Java. Here also I maintain the backup. Yes, same program. Nothing, no change. Java. Matrix operations one thousand cross thousand thousand. Thousand one. Yeah. If we uh, if we multiply uh, two thousand cross thousand matrices, I, 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 it can be multiplied in uh, one one fifty seven uh, milliseconds. Suppose if you want to multiply two fifteen hundred uh, cross fifteen hundred matrices. Yes, that is uh, available number of course is eight. Yeah, to multiply uh, two fifteen hundred cross fifteen hundred matrices, uh, it takes around uh, uh, twelve seconds, right? That many number of milliseconds, it is twelve seconds. 
So how can we reduce this particular execution time by using the same hardware? When we when you look at my laptop, my lap uh, my laptop uh, configuration is it has uh, eight cores. Number of cores is eight, and uh, and th threads per core is two. That means it supports the concept of uh, hyper threading. So actually, we have uh, four physical cores and uh, two logical cores for a particular physical core. Therefore, total number of cores is eight. Total number of cores is eight. Yes. Suppose if we uh, option is two, me option two means we are going to use the when we look at the number of argument. First argument is the number of uh, threads. The next two arguments is the um, rows and columns of the first uh, first matrix. Next two are the uh, rows and columns of the second matrix, and last one is the choice. Suppose if choice is two, that means uh, we are going to use the uh, we are going to perform that particular matrix multiplications using many number of threads. Here I consider two threads. When I consider two threads, that particular matrix multiplication can be performed in less amount of time. Let us see. When we look at the previous example, that means when the number of threads is one, it takes uh, around uh, twelve seconds. Okay. When number of threads is two, we can uh, we can compute that particular same problem. Um, we can come uh, we can compute that particular matrix multiplication in. Uh, as, as 6.5 seconds. Suppose instead of uh, two threads, if we consider four threads, what will happen? We can compute the same problem in uh, 4.9 seconds, right? That means same problem can be solved in less amount of time by using the same available hardware, by using same available hardware. Yes, this is the purpose of concurrent programming. In the concurrent programming, okay, by making use of available hardware, we're trying to achieve the higher, um, we're trying to achieve the better performance. How are we going to achieve the better performance? We are going to achieve the better performance by overlap execution of process or overlap execution of threads or overlap execution of tasks, okay? that is nothing great here right uh, dr pralin there are a few co uh, uh, comments or messages in the chat box you can please address them yeah yeah sure thanks yes yes op Operation is not OP. What what is the meaning of that? P is capital. Okay. Please explain the pseudo code. Uh, explain the source code. What is pseudo code? Okay. Most probably I will share a uh, whole code with you. Okay. I'm going to share that whole folder with you people. Um, you can execute uh, all these programs in your laptop. Okay. Do you have any problem? Please let me know because all these codes are very simple programs, right? This is a kind of simple matrix multiplication. Yes, here we have a simple matrix multiplication and matrix multiplication by using multiple many number of threads. Okay. Do you have any problem? Please let us know. Next, after that, yes, uh, how it is related to the power consumption, right? Yes, power consumption again uh, depends upon. Okay, suppose if you access the data from L1 cache, then it takes some amount of uh, power, right? Suppose if you are going to access the data from L3 cache, okay, then it is going to take some more amount of power. Suppose if data is not available in any one of the caches, if data is not available in any one of the caches, we have to access the data from the main memory then it takes more amount of power. Okay, here I would like to give the very simple example. Okay, that simple example is, uh, suppose consider the case, uh, T0, 
uh, this particular thread is going to multiply with these columns, right? This is the first, this is next column, this is third column, and this is the third column. That means this particular thread brings whole data from main memory to the cache memory. This particular thread, thread T0, brings whole data from the main memory to the cache memory. If the thread T0 brings the whole data from main memory to the cache memory, thread 1, thread 2, and thread 3, these three threads did not go to the main memory, right? For these threads, data is all available in the cache itself. In that context, they can observe a cache sheet and it reads the data from the cache. Then it, it saves the lot of time, not only time, uh, actually it saves the uh, some amount of power also, okay? Suppose to access the data from a L1 cache or L2 cache, it takes very less amount of time as compared with L3, okay? In that way, we can save the lot of power, right? Next. Next one, uh, when I executed this particular piece of code on my laptop, I observed this much, uh, this, this time figures, right? That is when the order of the matrix is uh, 1000, I observed that 1.5 seconds when number of threads is one, when number of threads is two, it is 0 0.8 seconds. When number of threads is four, it is 0 0.6 seconds. If order of matrix is uh, in that context, actually when number of threads is four, I observed around uh, uh, 1.5 over 0 0.6. That means uh, pi by uh, two. Pi by two means are around 2.5, right? 2.5 X speed up, okay? How do we calculate the speed up? Uh, speed up is calculated with the help of, okay, uh, Amdahl's law. What is Amdahl's law? Single thread execution over the multi thread execution. Time taken for single thread execution over the time taken for multi thread execution. Here, time taken for single thread execution is 1.5 seconds. Uh, time taken for multi thread execution when the number of threads is six, uh, 4, it is 0 0.6. 1.5 over 0 0.6, it is. Uh, 5 by 2, 5 by 2 is 2.5x, okay? Similarly, when, when we consider order of matrices to, to 2000, we observed 44 over 16. So, uh, that means 44 over 16 years. Similarly, here also we observed a similar kind of speed up, 2.4 or 2.5x, right? Yes. To, and, and to understand the speed ups and all these things, we should have some idea about uh, our system configuration then only we can write the better concurrent programs, okay? Uh, that means actually um, just a few minutes back, I showed the configuration of my system, right? You can uh, you saw that number of uh, threads per core is two and cores per socket is four. So total number of cores is four times two, that is eight. Number of sockets. Here, uh, this is simple laptop machine, right? In the, for, for my laptop, number of cores is uh, eight. Suppose when you look at the servers, okay, then you can find the number of cores is 64 or uh, 96 or 128. Okay, these one, to suppose if, suppose consider an AMD server, number if number of cores is uh, around um, uh, 64, those 64 cores may spread across uh, eight NOMA nodes. Here number of uh, NOMA, NOMA nodes is one. NOMA node stands for non-uniform memory access. NOMA stands for non-uniform memory access. What is non-uniform non memory access? Most people I will discuss uh, in the later part of this course. Next, uh, when you look at this particular processor, it is AMD Ryzen 5. And uh, when you look at the L1 cache, size of the L1 cache is 32 KB. Uh, here again in L1, you can find two types of caches, D cache and I cache. D stands for data cache and I, I stands for instruction cache. L2 cache, size of the L2 cache is 512KB and the size of L3 cache is uh, 4, 4 MB. When you look at the associativity of these caches, okay, associativity of uh, L1 D cache is 8, associativity of uh, yeah, L1 I cache is 4, right? Okay, all these associativities most probably you studied in the course uh, computer organization or computer architecture, okay? 
yes um, uh, how this uh, associativity helps us associativity reduces the number of cash misses okay yes in that way we can achieve the better cash hit rate next one is when you look at the cash block size uh, here you, you can see some interesting uh, thing line size here line size means cash block size and page size is uh, four, uh, 4 kb that that means 4096 bytes that means uh, actually um, uh, suppose um, we if you are going to if you process the requested data uh, if that requested data is not available in the cache memory required data is loaded from the main memory okay data in the how the data is going to be stored in the main memory data is going to be stored in the main memory by using the pages that means all main memory is divided into pages uh, if if the required data is found in any one of the pages okay then that particular uh, part of uh, part of that particular page is going to be loaded from the main memory to the cache memory how it is going to be loaded okay it is going to be loaded by using in terms of blocks when we look at this particular uh, relation, size of the block is 64 bytes and size of the page is uh, um, 4096 bytes, right? Okay, in that context, uh, you can see a particular page can be divided, page is divided into 64 uh, number of blocks, okay? And the size of the each block is 64 bytes, okay? That is the little bit uh, information about uh, my laptop. Similarly, if you want to know about your laptop or desktop, simply type LSCPU, you will get some information about your laptop and try to understand the purpose of uh, some of the things. It is, it is difficult to understand each and every point. Okay, at least uh, you should have some idea about what is the purpose of uh, L1D cache, L1I cache, L2 cache and L3 cache how the line size is going to be affected with the performance and all those things, you should have some idea about those things. And next, after that, do you have any specific questions? Okay, maintain, uh, does scaling maintain when number of threads are four and eight? Uh, right, that is a good question. Uh, uh, question uh, that is scaling is going to be maintained when the number of threads are four and eight. Yes, uh, till um, uh, four, we'll get the better performance, okay? Yes, from when we increase the number of threads from four to eight, okay? Usually we'll get the uh, 15 to 17% speed up, not more than that, okay? If we increase the number of threads from eight to 16 or above eight, okay? We, we never get the uh, uh, speed up. Reason behind that is, uh, this is a computational intensive jobs for computational intensive jobs okay uh, speed up depends upon the uh, available hardware here when i look at my laptop uh, hardware um, there is a hardware limitation right the number of available cores is uh, 8 okay suppose if you take the server with 64 cores suppose if you increase the number of threads from 8 to 16 16 to 32 and so on right then you'll update the speed up. Uh, right. At the same time, uh, when we are working with, uh, 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 when we are writing the um, concurrent programs, we should have some idea about uh, cache memory. We already studied about these cache memories uh, in BTEC second year or third year, right? When you look at the definition of uh, cache memory, uh, cache memory is a kind of volatile memory that provides uh, high speed access to a, uh, um, to a processor by storing the frequently used instructions and data. What is the meaning of frequently used instructions and data? Here uh, to understand this, okay, uh, I would like to, I developed a very simple program uh, with the help of the particular program you can understand the importance of the cache memory. Uh, yes, that particular program is
Yeah. Uh, here, when you look at this particular one, uh, yes, I would like to demonstrate. Uh, I would like, first of all, I would like to discuss the logic. Later, I, I, I would like to show the execution. Yeah, here uh, there are two functions. Okay, first one is read sequential, and second one is read random. When you look at the elements of that uh, sequence, read sequential and uh, read random, yes, we are uh, in, in those uh, two functions. We are accessing we are accessing the elements from the arrays A and B. Here, when you to, uh, when we look at that particular function sn values, okay, there are two arrays a and b. a of i equal to i. That means uh, array a is initialized with the elements uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on up to num minus 1. b b is initialized with uh, some random number between uh, 0 to number. Okay, fine. Here, when you look at the function call uh, read sequential, uh, how are you going to access the elements? B of A of I. B of A of I means, okay, uh, that means we are going to access the elements of the array B in sequential order. We are going to access the elements of array B in sequential order. Okay. Uh, suppose if we consider the next function read random, how do we access the elements? Okay. We are, we are going to access the elements a of b of i a of uh, b of i a of i of a of b of i means we are going to access the elements in random order in random order okay uh, do you have any doubts if you have any uh, if you have any doubts please unmute yourself and try to clarify your doubts are you able to understand these two functions Yes. Here and there are two arrays A and B. Okay, A is uh, array A is initialized with elements zero to num minus one. B is initialized with some random numbers. Here there are two functions: read sequential and read random. Read sequential uh, reads the elements. That means B of A of I. That means we are going to read the uh, read that particular array B in sequential order. Okay. Here we are going to access the element uh, array A, okay, in random order. In random order. Are you with me? Later we are going to update that particular memory location. That is the program. Okay. I would like to uh, test this particular uh, uh, particular one. Among these two functions, which one is uh, cache friendly? Here we have two functions: read sequential and read random. Among these two. Which one is cache friendly? Yes, sequential is cache friendly. Okay. Why it is see why sequential one is cache friendly one? That means here we'll get the um, concept of uh, spatial locality. Okay. That means you suppose if we access uh, to the memory location that are close together in space that means if you access the particular memory location in that context what what will happen a block of data is going to be transferred from main memory to the cache memory okay uh, and that uh, that means um, in, suppose if you access a of zero uh, along with that particular a of zero actually block of data means a of one a of two a of three and so on all those elements are transferred from main memory to the cache memory Suppose from the in the next cycle, or suppose if you're trying to access A of one, A of one can be accessed right away. It can be accessed from the cache itself. Then we can reduce the uh, access time. I'm at average memory access time can be reduced uh, for the uh, sequential one. Okay. Uh, now for a random method, I'm at is going to be increased. Right. What is the reason behind that? We are going to access the elements in random order. Suppose if you fetch uh, an element from the main memory to the cache memory, along with that particular element, block of data is going to be transferred from the main memory to the cache memory. Okay. 
in the when after some time processor puts a request for the next element that element need not be present in the cache memory okay in that context again it has to access the another block of um, and block it has to uh, read that particular data from another block so in that in that process that particular again uh, some other block has to be transferred from the main memory to the cache memory in that way we are going to waste so much amount of time in that way amat average memory access time is going to be increased okay yes cache memory works on the principle of locality of reference what is the locality of reference if a processor access some data now same data or neighboring data will be accessed in near future okay that is the local locality of the reference okay if same data is accessed then it is called temporal locality if neighboring data is accessed then it is called a spatial locality okay right okay that is the uh, theory behind uh, cache memory okay here when you look at this particular uh, diagram what can you observe from this particular diagram here the, here we can find the four cores core 0 core 1 core 2 core 3 okay uh, again two L, l1 caches one is l1 instruction cache l1 data cache l2 cache and l3 cache okay l3 l here l3 cache is unified for all the cores if data is available in l3 yes core 0 core 1 core 2 or remaining cores can easily access the data from l3 next suppose uh, if uh, data is available in uh, l1 cache of core 0 uh, okay how that data is accessed uh, by the core 1 core 1 is accessed with the help of some cache coherence protocol right data is accessed with the help of some cache coherence uh, protocol okay right most probably in the next um, tomorrow at least kalyan will discuss about uh, different types of cache coherence protocols how those uh, data is accessed with the help of uh, uh, moisy and messy protocols right okay with this idea okay i would like to show the execution of a particular uh, piece of code that that piece of code is uh, my cache operations in that particular uh, ca uh, cache operations program i declared three arrays a b and c when you look at we are going to initialize um, when you look at the size of that array is the uh, size of the n we are going to pass that particular n from the command line okay yes here uh, there are three functions sn values okay uh, that particular function is used to assign the values to the arrays a and b and second one is a read random um, read random c of i equal to a of a of b of i that means we are going to access the elements in random order next read sequential c of i equal to b of a of i that means we are going to access the elements in sequential order okay after that when you look at this particular logic this is very simple and straightforward logic nothing great here here we go uh, we pass two arguments at the command line uh, first argument is the size of the array okay the second argument is a choice if choice is one that is the read sequential otherwise uh, it is read random okay now we are going to execute this particular piece of code java java c my cache operations my cache java yeah what is the first argument first argument is uh, size of the array if size of the array is 10 power 7 okay that is uh, one after you can find seven zeros that is 10 power 7 and if next second argument is 1 that means read sequential so that means we are accessing the elements in sequential order if we access the elements in sequential order uh, it takes around 20 milliseconds 20 milliseconds for the same program if we access the elements in uh, random order it takes around uh, 100, 108 milliseconds that means 
if our program is cache friendly if our program is cache friendly we can compute that particular particular we can execute that particular program in less amount of time if our program is not cache friendly then it takes more amount of time and definitely we'll get the less throughput definitely we'll get the less throughput okay uh, that is why uh, while writing the concurrent programs okay we should know about uh, cache hierarchy whether it is there usually caches can be classified into three types inclusive cache that is uh, l1 and the, usually there are three types l1 l2 and l3 okay if l1 is subset of l2 and l2 is subset of l3 then it is called an inclusive cache okay next exclusive cache if l1 intersection l2 intersection l3 is phi then it is called exclusive cache okay yes um, there are some advantages with the inclusive cache and some advantages with exclusive cache okay when we look at the uh, total uh, available cache memory in ex ex exclusive cache is high as compared with inclusive cache but at the same time uh, when we are when we want to perform the write back operations or performing write back operations from l1 cache is very costly affair as compared with uh, okay inclusive cache mechanism right so uh, the scientists uh, come up with uh, a new architecture that is uh, non inclusive cache that means uh, l1 intersection l2 is phi and l1 uh, uh, l1 and l2 are uh, subset of uh, l3 that is non exclusive cache do you have any doubts yes and that is sequential cache is okay fine yes till now we discussed about two programs first one is matrix matrix multiplication program uh, take away from that particular matrix multiplication program uh, matrix multiplication program is okay how to use okay uh, available number of threads okay in a better way okay suppose if we consider your lab yes yeah if if you consider uh, if you have uh, four or eight hardware threads by making use of all the available number of, by making use of all the available threads we can get the better performance that is one thing okay next in the uh, in the second program okay uh, i discussed about uh, uh, importance of cache memory okay if you if we write cache friendly programs we can solve that particular problem in less amount of time okay that means we can get the better throughput when we write the cache friendly programs that is the takeaway from the second program okay till now do you have any doubts till now do you have any doubts if yes please let me know okay next one here i provided the sample code you can uh, directly access that sample code by clicking on that particular uh, sample code link when i executed this uh, same uh, program uh, on my laptop i got that uh, for array size is 1046 read sequential takes 7 milliseconds a read random takes 22 milliseconds okay for 10 power uh, array size is 1047 a read sequential takes 28 milliseconds read random takes 160 milliseconds okay here this is the average of uh, five runs right after that uh, when you look at the, this uh, particular slide okay uh, this is the uh, this slide gives us some information about uh, cpu trends okay yes right here you can see that in, in the x axis you can see that here okay from 1972 uh, to 2020 in in y axis you can see the 10 power 0 to 10 power 7 that is log scale that is the log scale okay right 
here um, when you look at the frequency of the process frequency of the process keeps on increasing uh, from 1972 till 2004 or 5 okay from 2004 or 5 suddenly that this particular curve is flattened okay here when you look at the slope of this curve here uh, from this 1992 uh, till 2004 or 2005 you can observe the different uh, slope from 2005 to uh, 2020 you can observe the different slope right what may be the reason for that what may be the reason for that A reason for that uh, why the scientists didn't increase the uh, uh, frequency because they face the um, heat issue right when we increase this uh, frequency to 5 gigahertz uh, yes uh, uh, chips are uh, unable to bear the heat produced uh, from the transistors okay yeah uh, chips were burned right that is why they, they didn't increase the uh, frequency what they did instead of that okay they're increasing the number of uh, pores on the die right in 2004 or 2004 or 2005 we can find uh, we can find that number of available pores is uh, dual core machines two cores or two uh, four cores okay from 2005 onwards to, uh, in 2020 okay amd released one particular processor with uh, 64 cores that means 64 physical cores and 1 uh, 128 uh, uh, logical threads 128 threads 64 cores with 120 that is a desktop processor i'm not talking about servers okay i'm talking about desktop processors that is a desktop processor 64 uh, physical cores and 128 uh, threads okay but the frequency is more or less same and that is the three gigahertz frequency so if that is the case suppose uh, if we bought a desktop uh, desktop server or no no de desktop with uh, 64 cores and 128 threads how can we uh, make use of uh, that particular de desktop or laptop in an efficient way so for better utilization we should be in a position to make use of all the available cores present in that laptop, uh, uh, present, in, um, uh, present in that, right? Otherwise, there is no use, okay? That's what here you can observe, number of logical cores, raise, steep raise in the number of logical cores, okay? So in, uh, in 2018 or 19, you can find that uh, number of logical cores is close to 100, okay? In 2020, actually, AMD released one processor with 128 uh, logical cores. Okay. Yes. Not only that. Okay. Performance of a system also depends upon uh, particular hardware. Okay. Uh, look at uh, think in a different way. Okay. Uh, suppose um, in in our computer architecture uh, course or computer organization course, we studied about uh, different hardware circuits. Okay, when you uh, when you think about different hardware circuit, consider a very basic simple problem. Simple problem is uh, addition of two numbers. Those two numbers can be added in a different way. One can use simple ripple carry adder. Another one can use a CLA based adder, carry lookaid adder and third one can use uh, okay uh, different adder when we look at the performance of parallel adder okay when you uh, when you look at the performance of uh, uh, cla based addition and duplicate addition CL, definitely cla based addition gives the better performance or um, that computes the particular addition less amount of time as compared with the ripple carry adder uh, but when we look at this particular single thread performance yes uh when we look at the uh, recent laptops we are getting the better performance at the same uh, frequency because of the single improvements in the single thread performance here also when you look at the slope of the curve okay from 19 uh, 80, 80 
seven onwards, at least we can observe the steep rise in the slope. Up from two thousand five onwards, we didn't observe it. Uh, okay, again slope is a little bit flattened, right? Yes. So to achieve the better performance, there is only one alternative. That is, we have to make use of all the available hardware in a better way. Then only we can get the better performance or better throughput. Okay. Yes. At the same time, uh, power consumption. Okay. Usually, power consumption of a laptop or any desktop or server depends upon the frequency. Depends on the frequency. So, if we fre frequencies, okay, if we increase the frequency, okay, um, then power consumption also increased. Okay, yes, usually we know the formula uh, uh, P is directly proportional to half CV square F, right? Okay, again, voltage is directly proportional to frequency. So, power is directly proportional to the F cube. Okay. That means actually, if fre frequency is uh, increased from one gigahertz to two gigahertz, power uh, uh, consumed by that particular processor is increased by eight times because uh, power is directly proportional to the F cube. Yes, that is the problem. Okay. Uh, next one. So here uh, I would like to concentrate on only execution times. Okay, later we can think about how can we optimize these execution times. Okay, uh, when we write a simple program, okay, uh, right, either in C or C plus plus, okay, uh, that program is going to be executed on the hardware. When we look at the uh, definition of that particular program, what is the definition of a particular def uh, definition of that particular program? Program is a set of instructions to perform a particular task okay that is the definition simple definition for the word program when you look at that particular particular program let i1 i2 and so on i and b the set of n instructions okay we know that each instruction is going to take different amount of time okay let t1 t2 or tn be the uh, time periods to execute uh, those n instructions total time of that particular program is uh, sum of ti where i where is from 1 to n okay here ti is time to execute the ith instruction right time to execute the ith instruction yes where ti depends upon number of clock cycles and clock cycle time okay suppose assume that number of clock cycles is fixed okay if we increase the frequency what will happen clock cycle time is going to be reduced when clock cycle time is reduced, okay, uh, then uh, TI is uh, TI of that particular instruction is going to be reduced. When TI of particular instruction is reduced, actually total time is going to be reduced. Okay, in that way, suppose uh, if you reduce the frequency, what will happen? Clock clock cycle time is going to be increased. If clock cycle time is increased, overall time is going to be increased. Okay, in that way. Uh, Execution time of a program depends upon uh, exec execution time of an instruction depends upon execution time of the whole code. Right. Usually, execution time of an instruction depends upon four factors. Okay. That is type of operation. That means, are we going to perform uh, addition operation? Are we going to perform multiplication operation? Are we going to perform division operation? Okay. At the same time, okay, execution of instruction depends upon type of the operands. Okay, are we working with integer operands? Are we working with uh, real operands? Okay, at the same time, execution uh, execution time also depends upon location of operands. For uh, that, I showed an example, right? Cache program. Okay, that in that particular one, it is sequential access. Okay, we uh, we can get the we we can access all those elements in less amount of time. When we can use the random access, it takes more more time. Okay, that fourth one is type of the circuit. Okay, to perform the particular task. Okay, so in the latest hardware, you can find uh, few circuit uh, few circuits that is fused, multiply, and add. That means multiplication and addition operations can be performed in one go. 
with the help of uh, hardware circuit. Suppose consider the matrix multiplication. In the matrix multiplication, what are we going to do? If you consider a uh, simple matrix multiplication logic, okay, uh, that uh, matrix multiplication logic is uh, we are going to multiply two matrices. How are you going to multiply? We are going to multiply A of IK with B of KJ. We are going to multiply A of IK with B of KJ, where K varies from 1 to something, right? It depends upon number of columns of the first matrix or number of rows of the second matrix. We are going to store this particular one in the C of IZ. For each element, we have to calculate this particular one, right? For each element, we have to calculate this particular one. That means for that, here we are going to write this kind of arithmetic operation C of IZ plus equal to A of IK plus B of KJ. What is the meaning of that? C of IJ equal to C of IJ plus A of IK star B of KJ. And that is the operation. That means in a particular, in, the, in that particular instruction, we are performing multiplication and addition together, right? Suppose if you don't have FMA circuit, fused multiply and add circuit, we need two instructions. One is for multiplication and one is for addition. So suppose you instead of uh, suppose if we consider two instructions, what will happen? Okay, length of the code is going to be increased. Okay, what is the length? Not here actually. Compiler converts high level code into low level code. Okay, length of the low level code is going to be increased. Okay, not only that. Okay, yes, execution time also is going to be increased because uh, first we need to compute multiplication operation later. Uh, yeah, that add operation depends upon the result of this particular multiplication operation. Okay, there is a dependency that is the raw dependency is there, read after write dependency. Yes. So, here uh, from this slide, I would like to show the execution of uh, two or three programs. First one is I would like to show a simple, simple code how the execution time of an instruction depends upon type of the operation. Later, I would like to show the how the execution time of, a, of an instruction depends upon type of operands. Okay. Right. Uh, consider very simple code. Here I wrote a VI. Yeah. yeah, this is the first, first one, my app one. When you look at this particular one, here I declared, uh, I created two arrays, A and B. A and B, uh, both are of type uh, integer. Both are of type integer. When you look at this particular uh, 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 function, SN values, here I'm going to initialize A and B with some values, with some values. After that, here I'm going to perform a few operations. First one is add, second one is subtraction operation, third one is multiply, and fourth one is division operation. Okay, it's a simple thing, not, not, not nothing great here, right? In add operation, I'm going to add a of, uh, I'm going to perform a of i and a of i plus b of i. I'm going to store the uh, final result in b of i. And then in the subtraction operation, a of i minus b of i, and I'm going to store the result in b of i. In third one, I'm going to multiply a of i and b of i, and I'm going to store in result in b of i. Next one is in the fourth function division operation, I'm going to perform b of i over a of i. I'm going to store the final result in BFA. Nothing great in that. Okay. When you look at the uh, um, arguments, uh, that means command line arguments, here I'm going to pass uh, two arguments. First argument is the size of the array that is that is going to be stored in the num variable. And second one is choice. 
based on the choice, we are going to perform the required operation. If choice is one, we are going to perform add operation. If choice is two, we are going to perform subtract operation. If choice is three, we are going to perform multiplic uh, multiplication operation. Otherwise, uh, we are going to perform division operation. Okay. Later, okay, here I'm going to calculate the total execution time. So uh, here I'm going to call system time dot current milli, um, uh, current time millis. Okay, after that here I'm going to call system, uh, system dot current time millis. Later I'm going to find the difference between these two. I'm going to print that particular one at the end. Okay, that is a very simple program. I would like to execute this particular piece of code. Java C, my op one dot Java. Yes, Java, my op one. Okay. Here, size size of the array is uh, ten power seven, and first one choice. If choice is one, means the addition operation. If one addition operation can be uh, uh, can be performed in twenty one uh, milliseconds, I would like to increase the size of the array. If I consider ten power eight, that particular addition operation can be performed in one hundred twenty six milliseconds. If uh, choice is two, that is subtraction operation. Again, more or less subtraction operation also can be performed in the same amount of time. Yes, when choice is three. Yes, multiplication also can be performed in the same amount of time. We don't find that much difference between uh, addition and multiplication. When choice is four, let us see. It takes 413 milliseconds. Yes, if you want, you can execute many multiple number of times. Yes. It is 413, 438, and 425. Yes, based on all these things, what can we conclude? We can conclude that, okay, integer division is costliest operation as compared with remaining arithmetic operations. Okay, here, uh, integer division, right? Integer division is uh, more costlier as compared with multiplication, addition, and subtraction, right? Are you with me? Are you with me? Yes or no? Okay. Here, I would like to change the piece of code. My operation one dot Java. Division operation actually takes more time, right? Okay, uh, I'm going to divide B of I with four. B of I equal to B of I by four. Let us see. When it is one or sorry. Yes, it takes very less time. Here also, I perform the division operation, but it takes very less time. What may be the reason for that? Earlier, when I perform B of I by uh, A of I, it takes around uh, four, 438 milliseconds or 400 odd milliseconds. Here, when I replace, uh, yeah, five, yeah, five by four, yeah, five with four. That means uh, final expression is uh, B of I equal to B of I by four. Then that particular problem is solved in less amount of time. Reason behind that is th this is because of uh, yes, right shift operation. Okay, yes, um, if, yes, who did that? Yes, th th that that is because of uh, compiler. Okay, compiler generated an optimized code for us. Okay, compiler did the uh, some task, right? So here we are getting the benefit from the compiler. Here we are getting the benefit 
it from the compiler. That is the free lunch. Nothing we did here, right? We are getting the benefit from the compiler optimization techniques. That is the free lunch for us. Okay. Yes. Next one. Here from this example, okay, takeaway point from this example is okay, execution time depends upon type of operation. Execution time depends upon type of operation. That means here in the um, division operation, integer division takes more time as compared with addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Next. Second part program. Yes, here um, earlier I considered A and B are of type integer. In this example, A and B are of type double. Nothing great in that. Earlier A and B are of type integer. Here A and B are of type double. Okay. Yes, Java C. My up to dot Java. Java. My up to. Ten four eight one. Okay, out of memory exception. Fine. Why? Yes, for same problem, suppose if you uh, run it a couple of times. So average time for the this particular edition is uh, 26 or 28 seconds, 28 milliseconds. If you consider the uh, my up one, that problem can be solved in less amount of time. See, here average time is uh, less than uh, 25 milliseconds okay in any case it is 20 less than 25 milliseconds that means from these uh, two examples when we compare the my up one and my up two here what can we observe we can observe that okay execution time also depends upon a type of the operands okay execution time also depends upon the type of the operands okay are you with me Okay. Right. Yes, execution time of an instruction depends upon type of operation, type of operands, location of operands, and type of the circuit. Type of the circuit. Uh, suppose when we consider old laptops, old laptops don't have FMA circuits, fused multiply and add circuits. Okay. Uh, on those laptops, if you perform matrix multiplication, it takes more time. These uh, recent laptops, I'm, I'm using uh, this laptop, AMD lab, uh, Ryzen 5 processor, it has a FMA circuit. That is why it can be computed in less amount of time. Next, what is free lunch here? Okay, at the beginning, uh, actually uh, for this particular course, I put a caption, don't wait for free lunch. What is free lunch? Okay, free lunch is uh, choosing the processors run at high frequency. Okay, yes, in olden days, what the people will do, okay, especially for the programmers, if they want the better performance, okay, simply they are going to replace uh, the old processor with the latest process. Because uh, when you look at this particular uh, CPU trends, okay, Frequency is increasing from year by year. Okay, in 1990s, uh, frequency is uh, around uh, 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 10 power uh, 2, right? Are you with me? Okay, and now actually in 2005 and so, you, you, you can find the process with uh, 5 gigahertz. Okay. Yes, 
that means um, when we replace the uh, a slow processor with the fast processors, we can get the better performance. That is the free lunch for the programmers. In olden days, that is the free lunch. But now we don't have that much luxury. If you want the better performance, we have to use some other alternate techniques. Uh, second one is uh, improvements in cache and main memories. Okay, what is the mean by that? Mean by that is very simple. When we look at the uh, different types of uh, uh, DDRs, okay, in olden days, actually, uh, we are going to use DDR, DDR2, DDR3, and now, now nowadays people are using DDR4, and uh, recently in 2020, uh, DDR5 is also in the market, okay? Uh, right. When we look at uh, and, and these, uh, uh, these uh, DDRs, are these uh, SD RAMs, synchronous dynamic RAMs, okay? internal rates these internal rates is 100 to 166 megahertz okay fine across all these different generations what can we observe we can observe that okay data rate is increased okay at the same time uh, we can find the rams with better capacity okay at the same time decrease in power consumption okay Yes, this is the data rate, right? When you observe this uh, data rate, okay, data rate of uh, uh, SD RAM is 100 to 166 million, uh, yes, millions of transfers per second, okay? In that context, we can transfer uh, 0 0.8 to 1.3 GB per second, Right. When we consider the latest uh, DDR4 or DDR5, DDR4 data um, data rate is uh, 2,133 uh, millions of transfers per second. Okay. So with that, uh, we can uh, transfer minimum 17 GB data per second. That means more data can be supplied to the processor. That means more data can be transferred from the main memory to the cache memory. Okay, you, you suppose if more data can be transferred in less amount of time, ultimately we'll get the better throughput. Not only that, okay, if you observe the voltage, okay, uh, voltage uh, DDR4 works at voltage 1.2, SD RAM or DD simple, the uh, SD RAM works at voltage 3.3, DDR works at voltage 2.5. That means that we, we you can you can see the decrease in power consumption. Okay, when the power consumption is decreased, overall uh, total power consumption is also decreased, right? Power consumption of the entire system depends upon power consumption of the uh, DRAM. Okay, that is why uh, in olden days we are getting that. Suppose when you look at the DDR5, DDR5 operates at voltage one point one volts operates at voltage 1.1 we don't find that much big difference between ddr4 and ddr5 that is why most of the people don't replace their ddr4s with ddr5s yeah this is this is also free lunch okay in olden days suppose if you observe the less performance okay we are going to replace uh, this the particular ddr2 with ddr3 or ddr4 we can observe the better performance Next one is uh, using compiler optimizations. Okay, um, in the earlier example, I showed one compiler optimization, right? Okay, uh, compiler is going to perform the right shift operation. A division means right shift operation. Suppose if you, if you want to multiply with four, then it, it performs the left shift operations. Okay, not only that, okay, there are different levels of optimizations, O0, O1, O2, O3, and O fast. There are different types of optimizations are there in, when we use the GCC. Okay, if we run, if we or compile the code with were fast, definitely that particular code is going to be executed in less amount of time, but it takes more memory. Okay, that is why uh, for better throughput, okay, we we have to compile that particular uh, program with a particular flag, either O O zero, O one, or O two, or O three, or O fast. Next one, execution optimization. Okay. In execution optimization means actually whatever it may be, suppose uh, that particular uh, piece of code uh, sh should be executed on a hardware, right? Hardware means ALU circuits, circuits which are there in ALU. 
okay uh, usually what kind of uh, functions are we going to perform we are going to perform basic arithmetic operations okay addition subtraction multiplication division okay along with that fmas and branch production units nothing great okay yes to how how efficiently we can perform that particular task or a particular operation that means take a simple addition operation for but to perform a simple addition operation it can be performed by using a uh, ripple carry order or it can be performed by using a cla based order or it can be performed by using parallel adders okay if you perform by using parallel adders it can be solved in less amount of time not only that okay earlier there is no concept of pipelining okay later after few years they introduced the concept of pipelining okay yes nothing difference between uh, pipelining and uh, concurrent programming when you look at the definition of the word uh, pipelining what is the definition of the word pipelining pipelining is an implementation technique where multiple instructions are overlapped in execution that is the definition of the word pipelining when you look at the definition of the word concurrent programming what is the definition of the concurrent programming concurrent programming is a technique where multiple processes or multiple threads are overlapped in execution right are you with me that is only the difference between uh, simple difference actually um, this concept of concurrent programming is developed from the concept of pipelining that's it okay suppose when we are working with multiple threads what we have to do right suppose when we use the concept of pipelining okay uh, we can definitely we can achieve the some speed up okay suppose consider a uh, very simple example okay uh, if there is a program uh, suppose if there is a pipeline uh, depth of that pipeline is uh, 5 suppose if you want to execute uh, n instructions okay if you don't consider uh, any dependencies that particular uh, n instructions can be executed in uh, 5 plus n minus 1 cycles suppose without using pipelining it takes uh, 5 n clock cycles so how much speed up we can observe we can observe uh, speed up close to 5x right uh, yes that is the concept of pipelining next when you look at this super scalar process uh, in the pipelining, we are going to fetch only one instruction at a time, right? Okay. In the super scalar process, we are going to fetch multiple instructions at a time. Instead of fetching only one instruction, we are going to fetch multiple instructions. Okay. Then we can observe, okay, some more speed up. Then we can observe some more speed up. Okay. Uh, that is the kind concept of super scalar processor not only that super scalar processor also supports the out of order execution because of that also we can efficiently utilize the resources in the alu and we will get the better throughput yes when you look at the uh, recent process recent process have this kind of architecture that is a uh, simultaneous multi thread architecture each thread uh, is a kind of uh, super scalar processor yeah, by using that particular super scalar processor, we can fetch some number of instructions in one go. Okay. Yes, in the execution, uh, if all the threads are overlapped in some way, we can achieve a better performance. If all the threads works on the same particular memory location, what can be done? Okay. If all the threads works on the sh same shared memory location, there is a problem problem of data races to avoid those data races uh, we can you we are going to use different synchronization primitives okay forget about those synchronization primitives okay when you look at this particular simultaneous multi-thread architecture the purpose of simultaneous multi-thread architecture that means re recent laptops or desktops purpose is to exploit task level parallelism that is the purpose of smts or smas simultaneous multi-thread architecture the purpose of super scalar process is to exploit instruction level parallelism. That is the difference between uh, actually that is with that goal, those processes are designed. Next. Okay. This, uh, this, uh, until now I discussed about the basics which are required for the concurrent programming. Actually, you should have some idea about, okay, 
architecture of the processor you should have some idea about importance of cache memory you should have some idea about how can we make use of the available hardware or how, how can we do the compiler optimizations okay yes once you, you have that idea after that okay when we are working with when, when, when we try to develop concurrent programs okay yes uh, we, we we should concentrate on some other things we should concentrate we should concentrate on some other things okay i will discuss those things uh, uh, within a couple of minutes before going to enter into that here i would like to discuss the difference between concurrency and parallelism till now i spoke about concurrent programs and parallel programs and all those things what is concurrency okay concurrency is a task of running and managing multiple computations at the same time parallelism is task of running multiple computations at the same time that is the main difference between concurrency and parallelism from these two definitions what can you observe you can observe that parallelism is subset of concurrency right okay you you can say that parallelism is subset of uh, a concurrency okay right at the same time uh, you can uh, yes concurrency is achieved through interleaving operation of processes okay uh, yes it can be done uh, using a single cpu parallelism is achieved by multiple cpus it cannot it cannot be done on a single cpu that is a, that, that there is one more difference between concurrency and parallelism okay major difference is a concurrency uses non deterministic control flow approach okay and parallelism uses a deterministic control flow approach that is why debugging of concurrent programs is very hard here debugging of parallel programs is somewhat easy as compared with concurrent programs okay this is the basic difference between concurrency and parallelism okay right uh, here uh, i would like to discuss about uh, concurrent programs okay while discussing about the concurrent programs i would like to discuss about parallel programs also okay yes i already explained the definition of a concurrent program concurrent program is overlap execution of processes or tasks okay that is the definition of the concurrent program okay uh, in a shared memory environment if the data structure supports concurrent execution of uh, uh, tasks okay uh, okay the that such kind of data structures are called concurrent data structures yes what are the problems with uh, concurrent threads suppose if we consider uh, two or more threads contained for a shared memory location at the same time and at least one of them updates the memory location then we face a problem that is data race then we face a problem that is data race yes here i would like to for to show that particular data race problem i would like to explain this particular data race problem by considering very simple example okay right what is data race problem okay actually in a shared memory environment two or more threads contend for a shared memory location at the same time and at least one of them updates the memory location and one of them updates the memory location uh, then we get the data that means actually other threads may read the um, uh, read the previous data or uh, um, uh, what can we say we can say that it is uh, invalid data okay because of that we will get the this particular data race problem that means two different threads may observe the different values at the same point of time okay usually that should not happen okay to avoid those data races okay we need this few synchronization primitives those synchronization primitives are locks and barriers okay here i would like to show before going to discuss about locks and barriers i would like to show you a very simple example uh how to use uh, uh 
Uh, by the way, are you able to follow the lecture? Do you have any doubts? Sorry. Yes, some doubts are there. No. Okay. So, may uh, Nikhil may know your problem. Nikhil. Nikhil. Please be free. Okay. Right here, I would like to uh, show the show an example. Pi counter test. Dot Java. Yeah. Pi. Yeah. When you look at this particular simple program. Here there is a method increment. When you look at that this particular method increment, we are going to increment that particular uh, counter value head dot count equal to head dot count plus one. Right, that is the purpose of uh, method increment. Okay. After that, what is head? Okay, head is initialized with. Uh, new node zero. What is what is there in the node zero? When you look at the class node, uh, class node consists of uh, uh, field int count. We are going to increment this particular counter. Okay. When you look at the constructor, this dot count equal to item, and uh, we are going to lock. This particular node with the help of reentrant lock. Anyhow, I'm going. To, I'm not going to use this particular reentrant lock. No problem. When you look at this particular uh, uh, function here, I'm performing simple increment operation. Head dot count equal to head dot count plus one. Okay. Right. Vi. Counter test at Java. When you look at this particular one, counter test, we are going to call this particular function instance dot increment. What will happen? That particular increment function is going to be called some number of times. That depends upon this uh, end time minus start time. If end time and start time is less than or equal to time, okay, uh, then actually, and then this particular body is going to be executed. If this condition is not satisfied, we come out from that particular uh, function for loop. Yes. By the way, what is this particular one? When we look at this particular class, all threads extends thread. What is the meaning of this? Okay, that means we are going to uh, overload functions which uh, override the functions which are there in the thread class. We are going to override the functions which are there in the thread class. Okay, run is a method in thread class. We are going to override that particular one. We are going to override that particular method with this many number of uh, these statements. Okay, here when you look at this particular one, first statement, what is there here? Uh, J equal to thread ID dot get. We'll get the particular thread ID, okay? Next, after that, count is initialized with zero, and that is for our uh, profiling purpose. Next, after that, when you look at this particular statement, system dot current time millis, we'll get the particular system time. Okay. Yes, we are going to calculate end minus start. Okay. Where is the start? Start is start is here. This is here start equal to system dot current time millis. Here we are going to get their particular start time. We are going to execute this particular function some number of uh, some amount of time. 
during that time this particular function is going to call some number of times okay uh, after that count equal to count is going to count is increment by one next here what is the purpose of uh, total operations uh, we are going to calculate each thread is going to perform some number of operations later we are going to add up all the operations that is the purpose of total operations when uh, when we look at the main method okay in the main method uh, we are passing two arguments first argument is the number of threads second argument is the time okay yes we are going to perform the increment operation with that many number of threads and this much amount of time that means each uh, both the th all the threads together perform some number of increment operations okay here we are going to print uh, what is going to we are going to we are going to print uh, instance dot get class dot get name we are going to get the name of that class after that number of thread total operations and throughput and uh, here after that here we are going to call ob dot uh, display okay in ob dot display we are going to call uh, instance dot display the purpose of that instant dot display is we are going to get that particular uh, count value head dot count is there right vi here there is a display method by using this display method we are going to print that head dot count value all the threads together incremented this particular counter value we are going to print it that by using that ob dot display are you with me okay and now i'm going to execute this particular piece of code anyhow i will share all these programs with you take your own time and execute all these programs okay uh, and try to get something out of it java counter test i use one thread so how much time 1000 milliseconds when i use one thread and 1000 milliseconds okay one thread performs this many number of operations how many number of operations the so close to 200 million right 200 million operations and throughput is uh, 200 point this one that is millions of operations per second so when we look at that head dot count head dot count and this one this one this are total operations that means we performed this many number of increment operations when we perform this many number of uh, increment operations head dot count is also same right initially head dot count is zero suppose if we perform that particular in increment operation with the two threads let us see what is the problem we performed this many number of total operations that is uh, 352 million number of operations but we observed that head, head dot count is uh, 179 million 374,562. That is pretty much less. That means uh, when we write a code for this particular increment operation, that means this particular piece of code faces the problem of data race. That means um, that head dot count is a shared memory, right? Okay. Each thread is going to perform some increment operations. Okay. Some of the threads is unable to increment properly okay uh, that is why if one thread performs increment operation and another thread performs increment operation in that context uh, increment operation performed with one thread is not visible to the other thread that is why here we observe the less value um, very small value as compared with the total number of total operations how that particular problem can be overcome we can overcome that particular particular problem by using logs log because log is a kind of synchronization primitive we can overcome that particular synchronization primitive with the help of logs. That means here what I did, I'm going to put a log before and after that particular statement. Okay, so that particular part is called a critical section. Now head dot count is in the critical section. That means uh, these logs are mutually exclusive logs. These, these logs allows only one thread at a time. 
okay if one thread performs the increment operation other thread is trying to perform the increment then it has to wait other thread has to wait okay in that way uh, we can get the correct answer we can get the correct answer that's why we can avoid the data race problem we can avoid the data race problem Yeah, if, if it is one thread, no problem. We are getting the correct answer, fine. If we use the two threads, if you use the two threads, when you look at this, head dot count and total number of operations, both are same, right? That means here output is correct, right? Okay, when we are working with uh, concurrent programs, first of all, we have to write a correct program. Later, we can think about the throughput. Later, we can think about the throughput. Okay. To measure the throughput, we cannot use the incorrect programs or pro programs with the data races. When we use the four threads, then also we'll get the correct uh, output, right? Here, total number of operations is uh, this one. Here, uh, when we look at the head dot count, head dot count is same. But total number of operations, head dot count, both are same. Are you with me? Do you have any doubt? Do you have any doubt? Yes, able to follow concurrent program. Clear? Now, uh, coming to the definition, right? Why do we need the synchronization in a shared memory environment? Okay. If two or more threads content for a shared memory location at the same time, and at least one of them updates the memory location, that update should be visible to the all the remaining threads. Then only we'll get the correct answer. Otherwise, we'll end up with data races. Otherwise, we'll end up with data races. To avoid those uh, data, to, to come out from the, that particular data race problem, we are going to use different synchronization primitives. Okay. One is lock, and second one is uh, barriers, and third one is usually we can use the transactional memory. Okay. Here, first of all, I would like to discuss about uh, locks. Okay. What is lock? Here, in that particular example, we use the reentrant lock. Okay. By using the reentrant lock, well, actually, um, uh, we cre we create a critical section, right? Actually, for the before going to enter thread enters into the critical section, it, it it acquires the lock. After it comes out from the critical section, it releases the lock. Then only uh, some other thread will be allowed into the particular critical section. The locks guarantee mutually exclusive access to a shared memory location in order to avoid bad interleavings. In order to avoid bad in Usually a key issue in design a lock is what action to take when trying to acquire a lock, okay, which is already held by the another thread. In that context, threads should spin on that same memory location or thread spin on the different memory location. If threads spin on the same memory location, what will happen? Cache coherence traffic is going to be increased. If threads spin on the different memory locations, we can reduce the cache, uh, we, we can reduce the cache coherent traffic. Yes, that is the thing. Barrier. Okay. Usually, uh, nowadays, people are using this particular barrier concept. Why the way um, this particular barriers concept is useful? Usually, when we look at the um, uh, cell phones or uh, videos or video games, okay, nowadays, most of the desktop supports uh, 120 frames per second, right? That means 120 frames is going to be displayed per second. Okay. In that context, what will happen? How that particular frame uh, that means uh, is going to be displayed? That whole total uh, screen is divided into um, um, it is. It, we can think it as it, it is a kind of two-dimensional matrix. Okay. Yes, 
each thread is responsible to display the particular part on the particular part on the screen okay suppose uh, once a particular frame is displayed uh, after that only second frame is going to be displayed after that only third frame is going to be displayed okay yes to display a particular frame we can use the concept of concurrent programming uh, we can we can use multiple uh, multiple number of threads okay next uh, actually in that process we should not mix one frame with other frame when we mix one frame with other frame uh, we can see the different types of images instead of seeing particular images uh, we can see the different types of images right okay uh, that is the uh, problem okay in that context such type of uh, applications we use the concept of uh, barriers okay when you look at the definition of barrier barrier is a kind of synchronization primitives synchronization primitive that holds all threads at a given point in the code and allows them to proceed only all threads are, have arrived to that point okay usually if an application needs a layered approach the barrier concept is help useful that particular barrier here while writing these concurrent programs we should concentrate on two properties first one is safety property and second one is liveness property safety property safety property is bad things never happen first of all any concurrent program it should satisfy the safety property okay next liveness property actually uh, we, we are going to write a multi thread code in, with the help of that multi thread code we are thinking that okay um, that particular program can be executed in as less amount of time that is the hope okay we are going to get the better throughput that is the hope okay with that hope we are going to write the uh, develop the uh, multi thread code okay yes uh, good things will happen okay we are expecting the uh, better execution times uh, that means we are, we are expecting the better throughput next usually implementations that means concurrent implementations are classified into two types okay blocking and non blocking okay uh, blocking suppose uh, in a multi thread application okay if one thread is delayed okay if all all its all other subsequent threads are going to be delayed then it is called a blocking based implementations okay next uh, non blocking based implementation okay in that context if one mm, these threads are not dependent on each other okay if one thread is delayed only that particular thread is going to be delayed all other subsequent threads can complete its uh, all other subsequent can complete their operations uh, okay uh, that is the non blocking usually implementations are divided into two types blocking and non blocking again in the blocking okay we are going to divide uh, application in two types deadlock free and starvation free starvation free deadlock free you know about uh, deadlock free okay any concurrent implementation it should be deadlock free any concurrent implementation should be deadlock that is the basic requirement of any concurrent implementation if a concurrent implementation is said to be starvation free okay then it should satisfy the fairness condition right fcfs first come first serve then only it is starvation free <laughs> the, uh, right that means uh, if every thread makes progress then it is called a starvation free then it is called a starvation free uh, next one is uh, usually uh, non blocking can uh, non blocking implementations can be divided into two types that is lock free and wait free uh, lock free guarantees that an implementation um, terminate after finite number of steps okay uh, right uh next wait free implement wait free guarantees that a particular method should terminate in a finite amount of time all that means so wait free implementation guarantees that every method should terminate in a finite amount of time that is wait free implementation lock free implementation guarantees that some operation uh, makes in progress that 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 is the lock free implementation yes 
ఈ ఇన్ లాక్ ఫ్రీ ఇంప్లిమెంట్ లాక్ ఫ్రీ ఆపరేషన్ ఆర్ లాక్ ఫ్రీ ఇంప్లిమెంటేషన్ వీఆర్ గోయింగ్ టు పర్ఫామ్ ది పర్టికులర్ ఆపరేషన్ వితౌట్ ఎక్వైరింగ్ ఎనీ లాక్స్ వితౌట్ ఎక్వైరింగ్ ఎనీ లాక్స్ ఇన్ వెయిట్ ఫ్రీ ఇంప్లిమెంటేషన్ యాక్చువల్లీ లాక్ ఫ్రీ ఈజ్ అ సబ్సెట్ ఆఫ్ వెయిట్ ఫ్రీ ఓకే బట్ ఇట్ ప్రొవైడ్స్ సమ్ సమ్ అదర్ ఎక్స్ట్రా గ్యారంటీ దట్ గ్యారంటీ ఈజ్ ఆల్ మెథడ్స్ కెన్ బి ఎగ్జిక్యూటెడ్ ఇన్ ఏ స్టిపులేటెడ్ టైమ్ పీరియడ్ దట్ ఈస్ వెయిట్ ఫ్రీ ఇంప్లిమెంటేషన్ ఓకే సో దట్ ఈస్ ది మెయిన్ డిఫరెన్స్ బిట్వీన్ లాక్ ఫ్రీ అండ్ వెయిట్ ఫ్రీ ఎట్ ది సేమ్ టైమ్ బ్లాకింగ్ అండ్ నాన్ బ్లాకింగ్ ఓకే వెన్ యూ లుక్ ఎట్ ది బ్లాకింగ్ బేస్డ్ ఇంప్లిమెంటేషన్ if one thread is delayed all its subsequent threads also delayed then it is called a blocking implementation otherwise it we are going to call it as a non blocking implementation yes uh, correctness of concurrent objects okay what is a concurrent object a uh, concurrent object um, a, yes an object can be accessed concurrently by using several processes that is called a concurrent object okay that is usually we can define the correctness of uh, concurrent execution by using the concept of linearizability okay what is linearizability actually uh, here any concurrent implementation should satisfy the two conditions okay two consistencies that is uh, sequential consistency and quiescent consistency in uh, quiescent consistency not allowed to reorder two invocations that are separated by the quiescent period sequential consistency is not allowed to reorder two invocations that belongs to the same thread okay that is sequential consistency any implementation satisfies these two then it is called linear that implementation is linearizable that implementation is linear that is the difference between uh, sequential consistency and quiescent consistency when we combine the both we can get the uh, definition of linearizability uh, today i would like to stop at this point do you have any doubts i am here to clarify your doubts hello hello so abhran uh, seems like there are a few comments in the chat box or questions you can check yes may you know the difference between software pipelining and concurrent programming uh, what is the meaning of software pipelining i don't have that much idea about software pipelining Uh, hi sir uh, this is koti am i audible yes yes go ahead hey, uh, uh, nothing like a software pipeline whatever the pipelining slide you showed right a fetch decode execution yeah 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 that, that, okay okay so that is pipelining but uh, when it comes to software pipelining we will do the unrolling of the loops to make uh, resource uh, whatever the resource available on the system which we should use in proper way like a parallelly that we are okay. doing software pipelining to achieve the um, uh, performance and uh, uh, less number of cycles uh, okay. so my right doubt here is what loop, is loop lo- you said that it is loop unrolling right yeah different optimization techniques are there to achieve the software pipelining okay. so i am not going into that part so what is the main difference between this software pipelining and the concurrent uh, programming that is what my doubt okay. concurrent programming is overlap actually actually you are doing the optimization within a task right yeah on the multi core itself also we will do no no that that means you are doing the optimization within a task or across the task no within the task only yeah within the task that is optimization within the task okay mm-hmm. here in concurrent programming we are achieving both okay uh, you mean yeah, across optim- the task uh, yeah across the task task also okay uh, that, that is one thing yeah one more question like uh, does barrier sync and wait free both are same uh, yeah. as per the definition i am asking no no barrier barrier yeah. is different barrier is a kind of synchronization primitive okay and uh, actually wait free and lock free are the kind of uh, implementation technique 
uh, but barrier sink also we can make uh, one core as a master and the rest of the course as a slaves like uh, all the slave course should uh, process um, as per the priority and then we can take the output on the master core so that is what i understood in the barrier sink implementation what exact that wait free also we need to wait all the threads should reach to uh, the one point to get the output right no no wait free implementation is entirely different from the we cannot com combine this barrier is a synchronization primitive okay okay actually we are going to use this barrier concepts okay while developing the uh, blocking or non blocking implementations Oh, okay okay yeah the usually suppose uh, here i showed an example how to compute uh, a b right a is a matrix b is a matrix right yeah suppose if you want to ca calculate uh, uh, a power n a is a matrix of order n by n mm -hmm. if you want to calculate a power k mm -hmm. by uh, by using multiple number of threads and then we 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 had to use the concept of barriers okay or a square b okay yeah we have to use the concept of where a b a and b are the matrices okay okay thank you sir thank you so okay. much okay uh next one is priority can play to make us our starvation free yes that is true yes someone asked about please suggest a few books to follow okay usually um the art of multi core programming by morris herlihy and nirshavit that is a good book uh, you can um, you know, buy that particular book and go through that next after that yes please suggest some book uh, yes definitely i will share that particular book with you uh, that book is art of multi core programming by morris herlihy and nirshavit Yes, right shift is done by the compiler. Floating right, that's it. May I know the difference between software pipelining? Is it clear? Okay. Okay, today uh, I would like to share some of the programs with you. Uh, please try. Are you able to come uh, complete this particular task within two days or three days? Uh, develop concurrent programs for the following two problems. First one is uh, report the speed up of your implementation by varying the number of threads uh, from two to sixteen. Okay, that is the problem. Here, first problem is you have to find the nth power of um, of a square matrix. A is a matrix of order n by n. You need to calculate a power n. Okay. Next one is uh, matrix chain multiplication problem. If we have a uh, chain of n matrices and number of columns of the uh, first matrix is equal to the number of rows of the next matrix, that means number of columns of a one is equal to the number of rows of a two, and the number of columns of uh, a two is equal to the number of rows of a three, and so on. If that is the if that is the case, we have to multiply all these n matrices, okay, uh, with minimum number of multiplication, with minimum number of uh, multiplication. We have to compute the product uh, a one times a two times and so on a m in less amount of time and try to measure the speed up. These are the two problems. Anyhow, I shared these slides with you. Uh, please go through that. This is in the fifty one forty uh, one slide, okay. Right. What else do you have? Any other doubts? If there are no doubts, I would like to close the session. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the great session. Okay. In uh, most probably, I will share these uh, all these codes. Okay. Today, I executed some set of programs. Right. I would like to share all these code uh, codes in that particular Google Drive. You can make use of these codes and execute it.
in your laptop or desktop. Thanks, sir.